Isaac Newton, in his magnum opus, The Principia, sought to explicate the fundamental laws of nature governing the motion of bodies. His efforts succeeded in providing a solid and extensive foundation for what would become the field of classical mechanics. Among the many notable revelations contained within this work was the demonstration that Newton's laws of motion and his universal law of gravitation explained much of what was known about the motion of the planets around the sun. That latter knowledge had been summarized years earlier by Johannes Kepler. Kepler analyzed what was at the time an astoundingly large set of astronomical data and formulated his three famous laws. These laws were not fundamental laws of nature, but rather they represented the brilliant and elegant distillation of a vast amount of meticulous observations. The three laws are, number one, a planet's orbit is an ellipse. Number two, a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And number three, the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. Not only did Newton's formulation of the laws of motion and gravity explain Kepler's laws, but they also allowed astronomers to make predictions that were later proven correct. The most remarkable example was the prediction that there must be a large planet outside of the orbit of Uranus. The planet we now know as Neptune was later discovered and found to meet all the criteria predicted by Newton's laws. The ability of Newton's laws to accurately predict future observations is indicative of the fact that Newton's laws were truly fundamental laws of nature. In this context, it is easy to understand why the Principia is widely considered the culmination of the scientific revolution, a revolution whose earlier stages had been advanced by people like Copernicus, Galileo, Francis Bacon, Tycho Brahe, and of course, Kepler. Isaac Newton also discovered the calculus. Everyone, or virtually everyone, who came after Newton would utilize the powerful but abstract tools of calculus to explain the motion of the planets. However, aside from introducing an intuitive notion of infinitesimals and limits to help construct some of his arguments, Newton made no use of calculus in writing the Principia. The reason for this omission has been the subject of some debate. Newton's laws relevant to this presentation include his first two laws of motion and his law of gravitation. These are as follows. Number one, the law of inertia. Number two, his finding that force equals mass times acceleration. And number three, his discovery that the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses of two bodies and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In 1964, Nobel Prize winning Richard Feynman gave a guest lecture to Caltech undergrads in an introductory physics class in which he attempted, quote, just for fun, unquote, to reconstruct Newton's arguments in the Principia without recourse to calculus. Previously, Feynman had taught an entire general physics course to Caltech undergrads, and the vast majority of those lecture notes, photographs of blackboard illustrations, and audio recordings formed the basis for the classic published work entitled The Feynman Lectures on Physics. Unfortunately, in the case of Feynman's lecture on the Principia, although the audio tapes were preserved, the lecture notes and any existing photographs were lost. 
The audio tapes themselves were impossible to interpret without corresponding illustrations. Then, in 1992, after Feynman's death, those lecture notes were discovered among the papers of a former colleague. Eventually, after extensive and meticulous analysis of these sources, David Goodstein, professor of physics at Caltech, and his wife, Judith Goodstein, historian of science and Caltech archivist at the time, wrote a marvelous book entitled Feynman's Lost Lecture, The Motion of the Planets Around the Sun. Thanks to their work, we now know that in the first half of his lecture, Feynman reconstructed Newton's proof of Kepler's second law, a proof that any student of physics with a background in geometry can readily understand. Feynman then admits that he has trouble following Newton's reasoning in developing a proof of Kepler's first law. So as he put it, he, quote, cooked up an explanation, unquote, of his own. Feynman's approach was elegant and innovative, and he ended by demonstrating the construction of an ellipse based on the geometric relationships of a planet's serial velocity vectors and the changes in those vectors' magnitudes and directions caused by the force of gravity. In the overview that accompanies this video presentation, you can find a link to a beautiful graphical reproduction by Grant Sanderson of Feynman's approach to constructing an ellipse based on serial velocity vectors. All that being said, Feynman's construction of an ellipse did not include explicit quantitative information regarding the dimensions of the actual orbit, which his drawing is supposed to represent. Furthermore, although he confirmed Kepler's third law for circular orbits, he made no attempt to confirm it for non-circular orbits. In this article, I propose to build on Feynman's approach in order to elucidate how a general formula for a planetary orbit and a general proof of Kepler's third law for any elliptical orbit can both be derived without recourse to calculus. The last part of this article, entitled Final Exam, provides the ultimate test of the knowledge to be gained from this article. Given the position and velocity of a planet at an arbitrary moment in time, can you derive the specific formula for its orbital path without using the tools of calculus?